Today's lecture is going to be about gas chromatography. So gas chromatography, or I'm going to refer to it most of the time as GC, uh, is really one of the most popular analytical techniques, quite frankly, in the world. It has a huge market. Uh, if you talk to the Shimatsu sales guy who sells us the instrument, he'll tell you all about it. Um, lots of money uh, spent on gas chromatography because it's particularly useful for detecting small organic molecules and identifying what they are. Um, so with the gas chromatography that we're doing in our lab, it's all a form that's called gas liquid chromatography. And so basically what that means is that we have a mobile phase, that's a gas, so our analyte's going to be in the gases phase. And then the liquid part means that we have the equivalent of a liquid stationary phase, although um, it's often an organic molecule that they say is liquid-like, just like an LC. So uh, the stationary phase, again, is going to be an organic molecule that's sort of liquid-like. So that's what we're going to be doing um, in gas chromatography. Now, all gas chromatography then has to have some sort of gas that's a carrier gas. So you're going to push things through uh, that you're going to use. In our lab, we use helium. That's the most popular carrier gas in the world. It's picked because it's small and it's inert. Um, the only problem with helium is that it's become incredibly expensive as of late. Um, and so some people now are switching over to hydrogen. It too is small, but most of you know it also has an explosion uh, part. And so I'm not brave enough to do hydrogen in our lab. Uh, so we stick with helium and we pay a little bit more. Uh, but please do turn off the gas at the end of the experiment. Do what you need to do so that we don't uh, kind of run ourselves out of um, helium. So with the gas, what we really are going to do is we're going to control, right, the pressure. And if you control the pressure of the gas, right, then that ends up controlling the flow rate. So um, we control how fast things go through by the pressure of the gas that we put. Um, OK, so for GC, the injection is pretty simple. Um, we have um, uh, um, uh, what's referred to as a splitter um, uh, in our injection. And so basically you have a syringe, right? It takes up a volume and then you plunge it in. Um, the injector is heated. And so in the injector, right, that's heated, um, you'll make your liquid and everything we're going to be doing here, right, uh, go into the gas phase, um, uh, as you, uh, heat it up. But most of the time, the amount that we can inject is actually too much to put on a column. We don't want to put that much sample on a column. And so the injector has a splitter in it, and you can set the ratio. But again, it's used to reduce the volume that's injected. And so you can set the ratio. It's almost always at least 1 to 10. Uh, and so 1 to 10 means one part goes on the column while 10 parts go to waste. But in some of the GCMS labs, we're going to set it at even like 1 to 100, 1 to 200, something like that. Uh, so don't be surprised at that. It's just that we can't get the amount that we want to inject. We use the standard like one microliter and then we just let the instrument kind of split it off um, and do the rest. So if we're going to go and heat it, and the same we're going to go from a liquid to a gas and vaporize, right, that means that to be able to look at an analyte, it's got to have a boiling point, right, that's less than whatever the temperature of my injector is. So the temperature of the injector is usually fairly high, uh, and GC is only good for looking at things with boiling points under maybe 300, something like that, maybe 350. Uh, if you can't get your molecule to boil, you're not going to be doing proteins or something like that with GC because you simply just can't get them uh, into the gas phase uh, with this injector. Okay, let's look at the column. So almost all of GC is now done with what they call an open tubular 
column. So with LC, we had all these particles, right? And they are packed into a column. Um, and with GC, that's not the case. Instead, it's a small tube, and our stationary phase is coded on the sides of the tube. But the, the middle is open, that's why it's obviously an open tube uh, kind of thing. Uh, and so the stationary phase is only on the size. Uh, the, the diameter, though, is small. It's usually less than 50 microns. So that means that stuff can't hang out too much in the middle. It's going to naturally go to the end. The length of the column is also very long. That's like the columns we use, I think, in our lab are either 15 or 30 meters. That's not, a, that's not an error. That's meters, not centimeters. So if you were to open it up, and unfortunately we can't let you open up the oven and look at it, it uh, it's just looks like a cap like tube that's curled, coiled around and around and around, uh, you know, so that we can fit it in the oven, but 30 meters of capillary. So as it goes around and around and around this capillary, it's going to interact some with the sides, but this is hugely long, again, compared to LC, uh, because of this open um, tubular uh, kind of format. So what is the stationary phase, then, uh, that's used? Um, the most typical stationary phase um, the most typical stationary phase is a form of polydimethyl siloxane. Um, and so here's sort of the chemistry, again, it's silicon chemistry uh, that goes into this. So we have these silicon uh, bonds uh, that go out. Um, and then basically it's a polymer, and so in the middle we kind of have a repeating unit uh, that'll go through. Typically many of these R's are CH3. And so you'll see it listed as like 5% X and 95% Y uh, on the package, you know, but sometimes R can be, you know, like a phenyl group or something with an oxygen or something like that to make it a little bit more, uh, a little bit less nonpolar, a little bit more polar. Um, and so I think we, ours, ours has some phenyls, like 5% phenyl and then the rest of it um, is just uh, CH3. So again, you change the percentage, you change R, right, to change the polarity. Again, columns are expensive. They're a couple hundred bucks. And so you typically buy a column and then try and work with what you have, uh, rather than just you know, um, changing the column uh, at your whim. But that's what a typical column will look like, um, uh, kind of polymer of that. Um, uh, as with LC, it's common to use a gradient dilution. So there's a problem if we just use one temperature um, uh, for our um, uh, chromatograms. They often kind of end up looking something like this. Well, the first peaks kind of come out sharp and nice and high, and as we go on in time, the later peaks that are more retained end up really broad. And so again, this is a band broadening problem. And it can be solved by using a temperature gradient. Right, so if we go then from low temperature, so things that have low boiling points are going to come out first in GC. Uh, that means they're going to spend most of their time in the gas phase rather than wanting to condense back into the liquid phase with the stationary phase. Uh, and so then after a period of time we might ramp up to a higher temperature and this usually is a ramp. In our lab you're going to get to design a few of your own ramps. So you're going to ramp up to a higher temperature, right, and then things with a higher boiling point are going to come out sooner rather than waiting. Sometimes if you wait, you don't even get them off. They don't come off the column uh, uh, if you have just a low temperature. Uh, and so this is our gradient solution. Um, um, uh, 
and uh, that we're going to be doing and learning about um, in our class. All right, so let's talk about detectors for a minute. In this class, we have two different instruments with two different detectors. The first instrument has a flame ionization detector. So we'll call that an FID. So you'll often hear it called GC, FID, so gas chromatography for the separation, FID for the detection. Um, the idea behind an FID is sort of this. Let's assume we kind of have a, um, uh, a sample kind of coming up out of a tube. Um, and uh, what we have at the top uh, is we have hydrogen that makes a flame. So I told you I didn't want hydrogen for the carrier gas, uh, but we actually do have hydrogen um, in the lab. Uh, so to be a little careful, uh, uh, the explosion thing to make the flame, because we need a really hot flame. Um, and so as my, um, uh, and there's also a little bit of air. Anyone knows anything about combustion and fire, right? You need a little air to fuel the fire, a little oxygen to fuel the fire. Um, and so um, there's, uh, you know, when you, there's three gases when you go into that uh, FID. There's hydrogen, there's air, and there's helium. We control them all, so we need a little the air to keep our flame going. Um, and as my sample comes up, you know, and hits the hydrogen flame, it burns. Um, and as it burns, then, um, uh, um, in the flame, what it produces, uh, as it's, um, it actually produces ions and electrons when pyrolyzed. Um, and particularly, we're going to pyrolyze things with carbons. So this is a particularly good detector for carbons. Maybe not as much for other things, but hydrocarbons show up really well on, H, on, on FID. And so I'm going to make electrons um, uh, kind of thing. And so up here at the top of my detector then, I have some electrodes. And so what I actually detect with my um, FID is I detect a current from those ions that are produced. And again, that current is detected at these electrodes that are over the flame. Uh, and so this technique, as I said, for car is used for carbon, and it's very mass sensitive. Uh, so you'll get more current if you have a C8 than if you have a C10, and it's very linear with the number of carbons that you have. Uh, so it's mass sensitive towards carbon, um, and it's useful for that. It's very high sensitivity. Um, but we don't really know anything about like the chemical composition necessarily, other than it works really well for carbons. Um, there are other types of detectors that you could use. Back in organic lab, I think that you use the GC with thermal conductivity. Um, and so basically in this one you have a heated element and as your sample goes along, um, the conductivity of, say, helium, your carrier grass, is much greater than any of your organic compounds. And so you'll have a high conductivity. Nope, organic compounds coming out, the conductivity will go, go down. This one is a general detector, but it's not as sensitive. So if you want the most sensitive detector out there, you're not going to choose thermal conductivity. The last detector we'll talk about here is, again, mass spectrometry. And we now have a GCMS in the lab. The normal um, 
sort of um, uh, one that's connected has electron impact, and again, we'll cover that in the mass spec lecture, um, as the ionization source and maybe a quadrupole as its detector. That's at least what we have in here. You can do chemical ionization as well with the instrument we have, but we don't have it set up to do that. So electron impact, you pound it with electrons, make um, um, your sample into ions, and then detect it with a quadrupole. And again, we'll cover these concepts more in the mass spec 